Dr. Ryan Gregory. Ryan is an associate professor at the University of Guelph. So um, Ryan did his PhD at the University of Guelph. He worked with Paul Hiver, the father of the Bartoli project. He became quickly a very prolific writer. He took an answer postdoctoral fellowship and he decided to hold this uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the American Museum of Natural History with Rob de Salle. Then he spent the second half of his postdoctoral stage at the Natural History Museum in London, where he worked with Alfred Bockler. He returned to his alma mater in 2004 to take a faculty position. He has been the recipient of many young investigator awards and keeps inspiring young researchers, and I was one of them because I happened to do my PhD in the same laboratory at the same time. His research revolves around understanding the, evol the evolution of genome size. He works on a variety of organisms that span across eukaryotes in his endeavor to break this C value paradox. So today, Ryan is going to talk about animal genomes, large and small. Thank you. So Melania is not the only uh, Guelph alumnus that I've seen here today. I'm surprised to see how much we've been actually exporting towards uh, McGill. It's great. Um, last time I was here, I think, was in 2010 for the CSZ meetings. It was a little bit warmer than it is now. Uh, but I'm happy to see that we're not the only ones suffering through it in the winter as well. It's about the same where, where we are. It could be in PEI. It could be worse. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to talk about animal genomes and mostly about genome size and a little bit about genome content. It's something that uh, has been a, a topic in scientific discourse for probably 60 or 70 years now. People started looking at amounts of DNA in the 1940s. And even as recently as 2005, with the 125th anniversary of the journal Science, we had this basic question about genome diversity listed among their 125 big questions. And so the way they phrased it is, why are some genomes really big and others quite compact? And to give one example here, a lungfish at 133 billion base pairs versus a puffer fish at about 400 million base pairs. For comparison, humans are about 3 billion. So it does ma massive range, even among uh, fairly closely related organisms, like just with invertebrates, for example, there's a 350-fold range. And this has remained a puzzle for that entire time. So this question about variability in DNA content predates uh, Watson and Crick's model of double helix. It predates the rise in molecular genetics certainly predates genome sequencing, something people have been thinking about for a long time. And yet, it remains, in large part, unresolved. So you still see examples here of attempts to understand what's going on in genomes of different size. Often that has to do with appeals to, OK, it's not all genes, but maybe it's doing something else. It's regulatory or some other function. We see examples like this, the unknown genome, uh, arguments about dark matter in the genome, trying to connect it with we see in physics uh, with dark matter in the universe. I think probably the most well-known example of that line of, of approach is the publication of the series of papers by the ENCODE consortium uh, recently. It's been in the press a fair bit, and there was a piece in Science last week featuring uh, Dan Grauer, who was a pretty vocal critic of ENCODE, and talking about his approach to uh, this, this project and its claims. What you'll notice, if you go to the Nature website that was put together for the ENCODE project, there's uh, sort of an interesting claim here. So this, thanks to medication, these functional elements, 80% of the components of the human genome now have at least one biochemical function associated with them. And even though this was a close to $300 million project with 30 papers published on the same day and hundreds of co-authors across those different papers from a wide variety of research institutions, that line is one of the dominant messages that has come from this project, and it's quite controversial, as it turns out. So here's the statement from the actual paper. Again, this idea of biochemical functions for 80% of the genome. A lot of critics have pointed out that this hinges on a very specific and yet incredibly loose definition of function, i.e. it's anything that triggered a positive result on any of the analyses that they did. So, even though it got attention as though they dismissed this whole idea of non-functional DNA and genomes of different size, 
it really is based on a very particular view about how functions should be defined. And so we see it over and over again in the press. We saw it in um, research summaries that were published in Nature and Science and, and so on. So this seems to be what most people took away from the ENCODE project, and, and primarily this idea that finding 80% functional sequences in the human genome does away with this notion of, quote, junk DNA, that really not much of it is, quote, non-functional. Again, it depends on how you define function in this case. So here's one of the one of these summaries that was published in Science, same idea. The ENCODE project writes the eulogy for junk DNA, and so on. So here's how they actually defined uh, function. So as I said, biochemical activity is one term that they use, which then gets translated into this word biochemical function, which I think the implication, at least, is that it translates into biological function, i.e. it actually contributes to a phenotype in some way. Here's what they actually measure. So it got put into this category of biochemical function, that 80%, if it's either transcribed into RNA, or it's reasonably close to a protein uh, binding site, or it has some histone modification or some other structural modification to it in at least one of the cell types that they looked at in at least one point in the experiment. Then it gets into that category of 80%. <laughs> so that's the claim that there's no junk DNA, everything's functional, is based on that definition of function. So here's some of the uh, critiques that have come out, including the one by Dan Grauer, which I said, it got a fair bit of attention, in part because it was, uh, let's just say, a very vigorous criticism, uh, and that in itself got attention. But there have been others, and all of these feature comments on the methodology and interpretation of those data. So it's a, it's a topic that's very much being discussed right now, whether this majority of the DNA in the genome that doesn't seem to encode proteins is functional or not. And it still comes back to, in many ways, that original observation of widespread variation in genome size that we've known about since the 40s. So let's go back even farther than that and just get clear on some, on some terms. If you go back to the original definition of a genome, which was coined by Hans Winkler in 1920, it's basically a combination of two ideas. It's all the DNA in a chromosome set, so the entire genome, or what we would now usually refer to as the genome size, and it also meant the complement of genes. So in that case, they weren't understood in a molecular sense, but the idea of some genetic element that specifies some feature in whatever way that it does that. And so that would be what we might equate with genotype. So it was meant to cover kind of both of these concepts. But what we're going to see is it can't really mean both of those things at the same time, because they're quite decoupled. What we do know is that a genome is not a blueprint. It's often referred to as the blueprint of life, but it's not a blueprint. And the reason it's not a blueprint is pretty simple. A blueprint has a one-to-one -one correspondence between any particular point on that diagram and the feature that it specifies. So for example, a blueprint, a blueprint for this room would have a part of the diagram referring to that other wall, and that would correspond in scale to that particular part of the building. Genomes don't do that. There's not a particular part of the genome that corresponds exactly to nodes or whatever may specify the production of a nose, but it's not a little tiny nose in the genome. And it's also not a string of protein coding genes. In fact, we know that most of it is non-coding. I'll come back to that in a little bit. So people do like to have an analogy. Let's say it's not a blueprint. It's not a string of uh, genetic beads. What is it then? If you need an analogy, I think a better one is with a recipe. So it's a set of instructions that if you follow a certain procedure, will provide, at least in rough outline, a result, i.e., in this case, uh, the cake phenotype. <laughs> so the human genome is likewise a set of instructions that if you follow a process, namely development, you will get the specified features, in this case, the phenotype of the human body. And you might say, well, if you have a more complex organism, then you're going to need more of those instructions to produce that more complex organism. So you might need more text in a recipe or more DNA in the genome. And in a very loose sense, that's true. So if I look at, for example, uh, E. coli, which is on your left, 
single circular chromosome. In this case, it's dividing. That's why you see it uh, doubled up like that. Versus a human genome with, with our linear chromosomes, there is a very large difference in size. And that does correspond to a certain extent with the difference in complexity. So this is an analogy that I'm probably going to have to stop using pretty soon because people won't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> the difference in size is roughly equivalent to this isn't the save icon, by the way. This is an actual storage <laughs> medium that we used to use. <laughs> it's about one and a half megabytes, and the E. coli genome is about one and a half megabases. And if you look at uh, DVD, it's maybe three or four uh, gigabytes of storage, and the human genome is about three and a half uh, gigabases. Now, as I said, most of what's on there doesn't immediately have an obvious function. So it's, you might imagine it's like a Windows 8 DVD or something where most of what's on there, we have sure no idea. <laughs> <laughs> if we look at genome size versus gene number, only in bacteria and archaea, so uh, I'll use the term prokaryotes, forgive me if you're uh, opposed to that, but either way, separate or together, there's a strong positive relationship between amount of DNA and the number of protein-coded genes in that genome. So really the difference in the fairly small range in genome size across bacteria and archaea is a difference in number of protein-coded genes. So you can get into explanations of why they vary in size largely by talking about why they vary in gene number. And there's a number of reasons why that might happen. I'm mostly going to talk about eukaryotes today because I think from the perspective of genome size they're much more interesting. It's a much more complicated sort of puzzle. In this case, and I'll just specify, when I say genome size, I mean the amount of DNA in a single copy of the genome, so essentially the haploid nuclear DNA content. You're going to see units used interchangeably, picograms, or trillionths of a gram, which is about the same as a billion base pairs. And you're also going to see the term C value and genome size used uh, interchangeably, more or less, in this particular talk. And C value refers to the term constant, it's a constant value. And that's an observation that was made during that early set of investigations in the late 1940s and early 1950s that the amount of DNA in a chromosome set within a species is generally pretty constant. So if I look at either different tissues within a single organism or I look at individual variation across members of a species, a single copy of the genome tends to have a fairly constant amount of DNA. So, that itself, as I said, this all predates uh, Watson and Crick and other evidence that DNA, not protein, is the molecule of heredity. This itself, this constancy, was taken as evidence in favor of DNA and against protein, which varies a lot from cell to cell. So they said, look, you've got this constant amount of DNA. Uh, that suggests that it's what genes are made of. And the problem is it doesn't seem to correspond to how complex the organism is in eukaryotes, or how many genes I think it might have. So it's constant because it's the stuff that genes are made of, and the amount of it doesn't correspond to the number of genes. So these apparently mutually exclusive observations got labeled the C-value paradox in the 1970s. When we're talking about variation across eukaryotes, we're talking about somewhere on the order of 200,000-fold difference in genome size across uh, eukaryotes. All of that is found in, again, if I may use a taxonomically a questionable term, uh, it's found across protists. It doesn't correlate, as I said, with organismal complexity or the number of coding genes that you might think. And so for a long time, people were debating how could it be that you can have relatively simple organisms that have large amounts of DNA or species that are relatively similar in phenotypic complexity that have very different amounts of DNA. Why doesn't it correspond to some notion of complexity or number of genes. I'll give you a summary. So this shows data for probably about 10,000 species that have accumulated uh, in the period between the 1940s and in this case about 2005 is, is even more now. And it shows my best attempt to organize uh, life according to a hierarchy of complexity, which is a totally bogus thing to do, but I tried to do it for the purposes of this figure. So if you imagine some scaling materia going from simple here to the, the pinnacle of complexity, which is uh, humans, as decided by humans. Um, you'll notice we're right here in the middle of the mammal range, so very typical genome size for a mammal. 
And some groups, like birds, tend to have small and fairly constrained genome sizes. Other things like salamanders and lungfishes are sort of on the high end of the vertebrate range. And you can go down and up all these different groups. And you'll see there's not really any, any correspondence between genome size and you know, my best effort at an intuitive notion of complexity anyway. Um, here's one that illustrates that quite nicely. So if you imagine the human genome drawn to this scale, this is what the lungfish genome would look like. So again, this all just reinforces that initial observation from the 40s that amount of DNA varies a lot across species and doesn't really seem to uh, equate with any intuitive notions of organismal complexity or genetic material that you might expect, or might have expected, I suppose I should say. So, as part of this debate on function in the human genome and uh, the notion that there's no junk DNA that's been reinvigorated by the ENCODE claims, I and others are sort of mentioning these variations in genome size, again, as sort of a caution about that. So it's one thing to look just at the human genome and say, oh, we can ascribe function to all this stuff. But you're left with the, the challenge of explaining why other organisms have or need so much more DNA than humans do. So as an example of that, uh, there's what we have sort of come to call the onion test. And basically, the idea is, if you look at any claims about what the DNA in a genome of humans is doing, and you think, oh, it all must be useful for function X, regulation, structural integrity of the genome whatever, protecting against mutations, whatever it is you think, you have to explain why an onion needs five times more of it than we do. And it's not about onions. I often people say, well, maybe onions can't run away from mutagens, but it's not about onions per se, okay? It's just an example. I could have put the salamander test or anything. Or for that matter, put the pufferfish on there and said, here's a pufferfish genome, now you gotta do the human test. How is it they can get by with one-tenth as much DNA as humans have? Plus, I chose onions because there are species that vary substantially in genome size. It's not due to polyploidy. So, again, if you don't like the comparison of humans and onions, why are you picking on onions? Um, just choose these three different onion species and it makes the same one. The argument, and this goes way back, is it's difficult to explain that DNA in the genome of different species uh, as being purely functional in some obvious, straightforward way given the massive amount of variation across species. It just is difficult to do that. So the question then, as I said, is not only how is it that an onion or a lungfish or other uh, species requires or makes use of many times more DNA than humans have, it's also how can other complex organisms, for example, pufferfish, get by with very little. And this is the kind of comparison you can draw across any major animal, animal groups you want. It's not restricted to vertebrates. You could do this with all kinds of different groups. So as part of the debate that unfolded on Twitter, as things do now, um, after the ENCODE results, somebody brought this up. And what you'll see is um, they basically said these arguments about upper bounds using the argument of DG Honey are just silly. Okay. So I translate, um, this is how ENCODE views that figure. So, anybody down here is just simpler than we are. Anybody up here is just silly, and we're awesome. We have just the right amount of DNA for it to all be functional. I don't really see how else you can interpret it, uh, given that kind of uh, view on, on a fairly simple observation. Of now, obviously, I've been referring to uh, concepts like junk DNA, non coding DNA. Let me calm your, your anxiety and tell you that the sea value paradox has been solved. Uh, you don't have to go home and, and, and lose sleep tonight. The answer to the paradox is most of the DNA in uh, eukaryotic genomes is not protein coding genes. So there's no reason to expect a correspondence between genome size and gene number. So now you're free of that paradoxical combination of, of observations. But, of course there's always a but in biology, but it raises a bunch of other questions, like, what is that non-coding DNA then? Where does it come from? What kinds of sequences make it up? What kinds of sequences make up the difference between genomes of different size? Does it have any effects on organismal phenotypes? Is it functional? How much is functional? And why do some groups, like birds, 
have very streamlined genomes, and others, like many amphibians, have huge genomes. We're still left with all of those questions. So I've tried to say, let's not talk about paradox anymore because we end up talking past each other. Let's say we have a complex puzzle with a bunch of pretty specifically defined sub-questions that we can address and move forward from there. So mostly what I'm going to talk about for the rest of, of the seminar here is going to be not so much the components of a genome or the sources of non-coding DNA, but that question about phenotypic impacts and possibly explanations for why certain groups tend to be constrained and others tend to have much larger genomes. But let me say a little bit about components of genomes just while we're on that topic. One great thing that has become possible with the rise of complete genome sequencing is you can actually look at what's in genomes of different sizes. Yes, it's limited to an extent to smaller genomes or more manageable genomes, but with next generation survey sequencing, which members of my lab and some others are now doing, you can at least get a snapshot of what the really huge genomes have in them. But let's look here at the human genome. So this is a summary. This is based on the early draft genome sequence from 2001. And what you'll notice is, as we've been saying, protein coding genes, so this would be the exons only, uh, are less than about 2% of the genome. So you're walking around with 3 billion base pairs in, in each nucleus, or well, I guess uh, 7 or so base, billion base pairs of your diploid nucleus. And 2% of that or so of that is, is encoding proteins. So that's this part. And about half, estimates actually go as high as, as 2 thirds, is made up of transposable elements or extinct remnants of transposable elements. And these are often described as parasites of the genome. They're basically sequences that, in an autonomous form, can make copies of themselves and, and uh, increase in copy number independent of what's going on with the rest of the replication of the genome. So they're often defined as uh, parasitic elements, selfish DNA, uh, one possible explanation for their high abundance is they're really good at making copies of themselves. So if we look at the uh, sequence genomes that go as far up in the scale of genome size as we can, so humans again with this blue star, we see that the percentage of the genome that's made up of transposable elements goes up with genome size and the percentage that's made up of protein coding genes goes down. So in other words, as genomes get bigger, at least in the sample that we have data for, did when I plotted this figure, uh, you do see an increasing proportion of the genome made up of transposable elements and less and less made up of protein coding genes. So that's probably one of the dominant kinds of sequences that makes up the difference. And that's consistent with what we're seeing when we do the next gen sequencing of, of really large genomes too. There tend to be a lot of transposable elements. So I think this is actually a, a better way of thinking about uh, <laughs> so, um, in case you can't read it, but I think you probably can in this case. Caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. So most of the sign is there because it's, it's there. But there's a bit that's functional, so also the bridge is out of head. <laughs> that might not be such a bad analogy for the genome. It's entirely possible that a large portion of it is there because it's good at being there. It's good at making copies of itself and not being deleted. And a smaller percentage of it is actually directly relevant in what we would normally call a function, i.e. contributing to a phenotype in some way, or being under selection, or whatever you want to use as a more precise definition of function than just transcribed, or something like that. So each copy of the human genome that has somewhere around 20,000 protein coding genes, that's your 1.5% or so, each copy has more than 500,000 copies of a transposable element called line 1, and over a million copies of another transposable element called LU. So for every cell in your body, you're walking around with 20,000 protein coding genes in it and a million copies of LU. Yes, various people have tried to say that LU elements are functional. They serve as binding sites for whatever, uh, however you want to, again, go through that. But I think it would be difficult to ascribe function to something that abundant when you have an alternative explanation, which is that they make, they're good at making copies themselves. Or in the case of LU, they're good at making line one elements make copies of them. I think this is a really interesting figure. It shows you where those LU elements are in the human genome. So if you look at something like chromosome 19, for example, a huge percentage of that chromosome is basically LU elements. Way more abundant in the genome than protein coding genes or anything with a, a, a much more obvious connection to specifying the phenotype. 
So what I want to talk about, as I said, for most of the rest of the seminar is how that level of variation in genome size is connected to organism phenotypes. And it starts with a discussion about cell size. We've known for a long time that if not genome size, and even if not DNA content, then at least nucleus size is strongly correlated with cell size. So here's a woodcut that was drawn by a guy named George Gulliver in 1875. And he was a surgeon in the British Army, and I guess as a hobby, got blood samples of as many different vertebrates as he could get, and drew them. So these are all drawn to the same scale. And he made a couple of observations. One is that there's a huge variation in cell size and nucleus size, and the nuclei are the stipple areas there. And he also observed that mammals don't have nuclei in their mature red blood cells, and they're very, very small compared to most other vertebrates. In fact, he thought this was uh, such an important difference that he wanted to classify vertebrates according to whether they do or don't have nuclei. So a pyronemata, no nuclei, and pyronemata with nuclei. Phylogenetically not valid, but uh, he thought it was an important enough difference. What's interesting is he probably didn't know what was inside these nuclei. So he had been drawing these for about 25 years when this figure was produced. And nuclein wasn't discovered until 1869, and wasn't published until 1871. And even then, it wasn't clear at all what it did. But what we would now call DNA wasn't known when he did most of these drawings. So he drew these relationships without really having any clue what was in those nuclei. So I, uh, a number of years ago, did something similar, which was take some photomicrographs of different species that differ in genome size and differ in nucleus size. And, and in this case, they're all shown at the same magnification. Some of the ones that I had done that he had also measured, his values were within 3% of what I got with the computer. So I'm pretty impressed, actually, that he was, was that good. Or maybe it's just I'm really sloppy with the computer. I was <laughs> hypothesis. What you'll see, again, is that the dark areas, which is nuclei, in this case, fulgine stain uh, DNA, the nucleus size corresponds pretty well to overall cell size. The bigger the nucleus, the bigger the cell. The bigger the genome, the bigger the cell. Um, to give you a sense of perspective on, on how much cell size can vary across different vertebrates, there's two figures here, and they show the same thing. Uh, one was taken by a light microscopy in the 30s, and the other is a scanning electron micrograph from the 90s. And what you're looking at with these huge cells here is a blood cell from a salamander called Amphiuma, which is an aquatic salamander, huge cells. To give you a sense of scale, in both cases, these little Circular things are human blood cells. So you can imagine the physical and physiological implications, just on the face of it, of circulating blood cells this big through a body, you know, a couple of feet long, versus circulating little cells like this. Well, okay, we're not all that big a body, but a large, much larger body than the salamander. And the kinds of effects there might be in terms of gas exchange or number of cells that you can fit per blood volume, or any of those kinds of, of properties that are dependent on cell size. Well, now we can actually measure genome size. We don't have to just look at nucleus size. And when we do that, if we look at the groups of vertebrates that have nucleated blood cells, you can see that in each case, there is a positive correlation between genome size and whatever measure of cell size we use. In this case, uh, dry outer uh, blood cell area. There's some that are volume. Just, it doesn't really matter how you measure it. It's correlated positively across all the groups that have nucleated red blood cells. Which raises the interesting question about mammals, and this is actually where the animal genome size database started. I was interested in finding the paper that said there was a relationship between genome size and cell size in mammals, because everybody kind of assumed it based on some stuff I'm going to talk about in a minute. And I couldn't find it, and I realized it doesn't exist. So I started to compile data on cell size and genome size for as many mammals as I could, including finding Gulliver's paper. And when I finished with that, I said, ah, do birds, why not? Did birds, nah, maybe I'll do all the vertebrates. Okay, nah, I should probably do all the vertebrates too. But now I have the, the animal genome size data. So it started with this, this graph, basically. And what it shows is that there is still a significant positive relationship between genome size and cell size, red blood cell size in mammals, even though mature red blood cells in mammals don't contain nuclei. They don't contain a genome. So how is that 
Well, I think what, what it means is that it's affecting the size of the progenitor cells before they differentiate, and that effect on size carries over to when the uh, enucleation happens and they boot out the nucleus. So anyway, here's an example of a bat. This is my cat, this is me, and this is the red biscuit rat, which is the only polyploid mammal known, and it has the largest uh, blood cells in the data set. Um, you can see on my cat was acknowledged in the paper, so it's, it's all good. Uh, graciously donated a blood cell. So here's the scenario again, where you have an impact on the early undifferentiated blood cell in terms of size, based on nucleus size, and then it, it uh, maintains that difference when the nucleus is ejected. So this is one project that I'd like to kind of pursue at some point, although it's difficult to get samples, is to look at um, whether that seems to make sense. It turns out in mammals there's actually two lines of red blood cells that you see. One is uh, enucleated, so no nuclei, that's the one you see in adults. But there's also a nucleated, they call primitive, cell line in newborns and embryos. So what you're looking at is a graph of cell volume versus genome size for a bunch of different fishes. And I put them on there because they cover more or less the range of genome sizes that I wanted to talk about. And here are the same data, blood cell volume, genome size for mammals, using those non-nucleated red blood cells. And this point is for mouse, but embryos. So nucleated red blood cells in a mammal. And they fit right along pretty much where you would expect on this line. So what would be, this is the adult uh, version of the cells, and you see that they fall down where the rest of the mammals are. So I would really find it interesting to look at the embryonic blood cells for a wide variety of mammals of different genome sizes and see if they all suddenly show up on this main line, like you would see across all the other vertebrates. It's not so easy to get uh, elephant embryo blood and so on, so it's, it's a bit tricky to do. Some people have argued that this relationship between genome size, or nucleus size, and cell size is not really causal. So, there's a couple of options. One is, you just have a bigger cell, you can hold more DNA. 